as he said, I'm Ross Kippenbrock. Um, we're going to talk about finding lane lines um, for self-driving cars. So a little bit about me. Um, despite my German-sounding last name, I'm from the United States. I grew up in the, the middle of the country. Um, it just happens to be host to one of the largest motorsports events, um, the Indianapolis 500. So from an early age, I got interested in motorsports and um, went to college for mechanical engineering, got involved in motorsports there, worked in NASCAR for um, four years doing simulation, um, software development, um, and uh, many other things. Uh, I traveled to the racetracks with the team and did uh, race strategy. So um, I met the guys from Y Hat when I was working in NASCAR and decided to go up to New York and work for them. And um, we were just recently acquired by Altrix. Um, so talking about self-driving cars, there's a lot of news these days about this company suing this company over self-driving car technology or this company teaming up with this other one. Um, there's a lot of new jobs in the space, so it's a really hot topic. Um, but today I just kind of want to show you that it's, it's not as scary as it seems to do a simple task um, that, they, that they, uh, the big guys do. So at, at the core, autonomous cars, they need to carry out three tasks. They need to perceive the world, they need to make a decision based on these perceptions and then ultimately carry out some action. So for perception, um, these cars are equipped with many sensors, uh, one of them being a LiDAR unit on the top of the car. That's kind of the big ball you'll see um, when one of them drives by you. So that's a laser range finding system. It's going to be scanning 360 degrees around the vehicle and measuring distances to objects. Um, and then for closer in um, detection, they're, they're going to use radar sensors to measure distances to objects around them. Um, and then also, they're going to have cameras all around the car. We're going to be looking at the forward-facing camera today and analyzing those images. So that's the perception piece, which feeds a, a number of algorithms to make decisions. And here's a few. Um, samples from the Google self-driving car, um, making decisions about stopping at a red light, maintaining that uh, stop position while the, r the light remains red. Um, that upper picture is dis it's deciding to make a lane change when there's an obstruction. Um, and then this lower one, it's actually switching lanes when uh, there's a cyclist in the right lane. So making decisions about where is safe to drive and if we need to come to a stop. So the final piece is carrying out some action. This is actually steering the, steering the car or stopping the car, applying more or less throttle. Um, so here, here's an example of the um, Tesla autopilot system coming to a stop when there's an accident in front of it. Um, this top one is the Google car stopping when it looks like there's a wheelchair and possibly chasing some dog. Um, but I think they're pretty excited that their car came to a stop there, even though that's, that's not data that they had trained with. Um, so finding lane lines is part perception. We're going to be using that forward-facing camera. Um, and then we're going to make a decision about where those lane lines are and where it's safe to drive. So here's an example of um, the kind of thing we're going to be building. It's, it's just uh, processing the video as a series of images. We're going to um, produce this nice green area that's safe, safe space to drive in. So in order to carry this out, there's, there's going to be five main steps we'll walk through. Um, the first is to undistort the images. Um, the raw camera images are, have a little bit of distortion, so we'll carry that out. We're going to warp the image um, so we have a bird's eye view perspective looking down on the road. We'll isolate the lane line pixels from the surrounding image. We'll, we're going to fit a curve through those pixels and then take all that information, overlay it with that original image, and we'll get that nice video. 
So the first step, <clears throat> removing distortion. Um, so camera lenses, cameras use lenses that uh, distort the image so you can fit more, um, more of the surroundings into a smaller frame. So this is the, the typical type of distortion that you'll see with these cameras. It's called barrel distortion where it looks like those straight lines are bowed on the outside of the image. So if we were to take this image and do that transformation warping to get a bird's eye view, the, the lines that should be straight would, would have kind of a bow to them. So we need to do some uh, distortion corrections. Um, luckily, OpenCV has an, a, a number of functions that'll help us do this. If you take some pictures of chessboards at various, um, various perspectives, it, they suggest at least 10 photos. Um, I use 20 to, to calibrate this camera. But um, you just take a series of these chessboard images and then let OpenCV find those corners in the image using this find chessboard corners function. If, you, if this returns um, that it's found those points, you add them to a, a list of these uh, corner points and then pass it into the calibrate camera function, which just takes those image points that you found on the chessboards, and it's gonna return a set of distortion coefficients, which will um, transform the, the image based on like a series of different um, distortions, and then also there's a camera matrix. So there's some linear algebra behind the scenes. I'd suggest looking at the OpenCV documentation if you really wanna get to know, know and love those functions. Um, they do a really good job of explaining kind of what's going on under the hood. But um, now that we have our camera calibrated, we can use another function called undistort, which takes that original image, those two matrices that we found previously, and you apply it and it'll, it'll uh, return this undistorted image. So you can see that the, uh, those outside lines that were kind of bowed um, are now pretty straight. So um, we should be able to get that bird's eye view we were talking about. So we really want this for um, fitting, fitting curves and finding lane lines. It's gonna be easier to find those lines if we can look down on the subject instead of looking out on it. So to do that, we, we have to have a set of source points from the original image. So those are kind of, those are gonna look like lanes going off to infinity. Um, and we wanna take those points and warp them into straight lines. So this is just a straight road, so those lines should end up straight when we do the, the actual image warping. Um, and to do that, we call this get perspective transform function which returns another matrix, more linear algebra, who knows what's going on. Um, but then you take the output of that, that matrix, apply this warp perspective to that original image with that matrix, and it's gonna return this warped perspective. So as you get towards the top of the image, you notice that it gets a little more pixelated. Um, obviously we can't create resolution that didn't exist in the Im original image, but there should be enough fidelity there to isolate those pixels from the surrounding image. So how do we go about doing that? There's gonna be two approaches that we'll take. One is color selection, and the other one's gonna be edge detection. So for color selection, we're gonna first kinda look at what an image is inside of a computer. Um, so taking a look at the first 10 pixels of an image, just zooming in on that, you can see that it's just a series of these little squares. And each one of these squares, if we look at the uh, value that prints out, is a set of three values in a list. Um, so these, these do mean something. One of them is a red value, a green value, and a blue value. And uh, these go from zero to 255 in most images, um, just because they're 8-bit images, 2 to the 8th is 256, so 0 to 255. If all these are 255, 
it's going to output white. If they're all zero, it's going to be black. And then for each channel, the full value would, so if it's 255, zero, zero, that'll be all red. And if anyone's messed around with one of these sliders, that's really what you're doing. So looking at the first two by two pixels on this image, you can see that it's really just a set of columns and rows. So knowing that, it's going to be um, a little bit easier to understand that we can isolate different color channels within this. So there are more color spaces than red, green, blue. Um, and some of these might help us to isolate those lane line pixels from the surrounding image. Uh, a couple others are these hue, saturation, light, and value color spaces. So those, um, they just take RGB colors and then turn them into this other representation of that same image. And then there's a number of other ones. There's, this one is called lab. It uses lightness. And then there's two axes for the, the color. Um, and these, these are going to prove pretty helpful. So luckily, OpenCV makes it really easy to convert between these. You just use this convert color function, pass in an RGB color or, or any other color, um, as long as you have the correct um, conversion coefficient, which is that color underscore RGB to HLS. Um, so this outputs in a hue light saturation image which looks a little different, but it's really the same thing. It's just a different representation of that same image. So from here, we can isolate each layer of that image. So there's the red layer, the green layer, the blue layer. If we look at those individually, um, using this notation where we're looking at all the rows, all the columns of the image, and just that first value in each of those RGB triples, and then plot all those, you can start to see that that yellow left lane line is showing up in the red and the green channel, but not the blue channel. If we go back to that Venn diagram of how colors work, um, red and green, the combination of those two produces yellow. So those are going to be good indicators for a yellow lane line. Um, so if we do this for all of the uh, a host of different color spaces in that warped perspective, and start to see that some of these look like they might help us to find those lane lines. Like the, those bottom two are just producing a white value where that left lane line is. Um, some of them aren't going to be so useful, like those Q channels in the upper left. And then here's just another example of a, of a different image that's a little bit harder. Um, so if we just pull out the best of those, and take a look at them. It looks like some of these might be pretty useful. Um, here, the saturation channel in the upper right um, looks pretty good. Um, it's isolating those white lane lines, even though the original image is kind of a white roadway, typically where like a bridge is um, in the US. But in this, in this image, because there's a shadow across the road, um, that saturation channel doesn't look quite as good. So there's going to be some um, trade-off here between which channels we use and how we use them. But getting into edge detection, um, OpenCV has a couple functions that will detect edges for us. And all this Sobel operator is really doing is taking the derivative of one of those color um, channels. <clears throat> so if we pass in that red channel, if we have like a red meeting white, it's going to detect a, a line where, that, um, where those two meet. It's just going to detect the derivative across that line. So the value of that derivative is what this, um, this plot is. So it does it in the x direction and then the y direction. And then you can calculate the magnitude just as the sum of those two squares. <clears throat> and this proves to be pretty useful on occasions where our color detection system might not work so well. Um, so it's a good substitute. And then there's another one called canny edge detection, which just uses that same Sobel system, but applies a couple 
nice little tricks that throws out pixels that aren't part of the edge and then also thresholds um, the image to try to connect edges that weren't connected before. Um, so we're gonna use both of these to produce our final guess at where the lane lines are. To do that, we look at this binary thresholding. So this is um, an example of the red channel. It looks like wherever the red channel's saying there's a white pixel, a high value for the red channel, um, it looks like there's a lane line there. So if we just apply a threshold to this red channel image and write the output of that thresholding to a new image, um, we're gonna get an image where everything is black except the lane lines. So here the threshold is between 200 and 255, which indicates whiter on that um, grayscale image. But um, we can adjust these thresholds to try to capture more or less of the, of the lane lines. And then once we do that to all the color channels and then add in the edge detection as just a series, like a linear um, addition, so anywhere that there's a white pixel on one of these binary thresholding images, we just add it to a, the final image. So then we go, we do our red channel. This is just two, but um, you could have n number of channels here. But we do it for the red, we add the Sobel um, edge detection, and then we output this final binary, which is our guess at where those lane line pixels are. Um, I built this kind of interesting, maybe somewhat interesting, little slider thing here to show you that you can tune these thresholds and try to add more or less content. Um, so if you flip these little knobs, eventually you'll just guess um, like the whole image is a line. See, like it's a... Uh, it's upset because there's too much. So yeah, like these look pretty good. Um, where's the, here we go. So yeah, there the S moved and we got a little bit more of that left lane line. So you, you can mess around with these thresholds enough where you, you're capturing just the lane lines and um, none of the surrounding image. But it, it's a bit of a trade off. Some images, um, they look better than others, and some of the thresholds, you need to tune them, like to, for that shadow image, you need to tune them for that image, but in other images, they'd be a little bit better if, if you dialed back those thresholds a little bit. But now that we have this binary image, we can just run a, some, a little algorithm to find the left and the right lines, and then we can uh, apply a curve fit to those lines. So method one is, can be um, applied on any image. Um, and method two here, it needs a previous fit, but it runs quite a bit faster. Um, so we, we try to use method two where possible, but if we don't find a fit, we kind of fall back to this uh, first method, which is a little slower, but a little more robust. Um, so for method one, we take a histogram of the bottom half of the image, and wherever that histogram peaks, that's where we think that the line starts. And so the y value here is just the sum of the pixels at that x location. And the two maximums are where those lines start. But this is a good indicator of how close it can be between a false value and a, and a real value. So here, the, the lane that's to the right of ours, we're detecting that line too. So um, throwing out some of these ex extraneous points would be probably pretty useful for this algorithm. Um, but anyway, we have our two, our left start and our right start. So we, we're gonna draw a box around those starting points. And any of those white pixels from the binary image that fall in that box, we'll just put them in a big list of X and Y values. And then, for the next one, we'll just add a box on top of that and do the same thing. And as we move up the line, we'll move the, the boxes based on the average of the previous line. So if the average starts moving to the left, we'll know that the box 
the next box needs to go to the left. Um, that's, that's how these boxes start following that line. So at the end of this, we have a big list of all of the Y values and all the X values of the pixels that were in that line. And you can just run a NumPy polyfit, second order polyfit to those pixels, and that gives us the curve fit in pixel space. Um, you can measure the, dis, like the pixel to meter conversion by knowing that in the United States, the lanes are, um, I think they're like three meters wide, 12 feet. I don't, I don't know what that is in meters. But um, so you just do that conversion, and then for the Y direction, you know that there, each of these dashed lines is 10 feet long um, on the right, and you, there's a set gap. So the federal government likes to control all this on the highways. So um, it gives us a good conversion, so we can go from pixel measurements to meter measurements. Um, so looking at method two, it just relies on a previous fit. We take that previous fit and move it to the left and the right by 100 pi pixels, and that creates this green boundary. And any pixels that lie in that green boundary, we throw those in a list and then run that same uh, polyfit system. And that produces these yellow lines, which they seem to look pretty good. So the final piece is creating that, that nice image. Um, we had a little bit of text on there. One of them was a radius of curvature. So this is gonna help the car to guess how, how tight the turn needs to be, how much steering wheel he needs to put in, um, he or she, it, <laughs> what are computers. Um, so this is, you know, there's a little bit of calculus here. We don't, we don't need to get into that, but this um, just uses those, fit, those fits that we found previously and then calculates a radius of curvature. Also useful is the distance to the center of the lane. So if the, if the car starts veering to the left, if we keep track of that, um, you can just have like a simple controller so that the car will add a little bit of right steering wheel angle to bring it back into the center of the lane. Um, and it's fairly straightforward to get this value if you know where the X locations of the right and the left lane are. Um, and you assume that the camera's on the center line of the car, then the center line of the car is at the center of the image. Um, so that's, that's how I got those values. Um, obviously, if it's not mounted on the center, then there just need to be some offset here. So getting that, that nice green picture, um, you just take the two curve fits you found, plot those on the, on the image using this polylines function, and then fill in the space between those lines with the, the green fill, which is that first function, the fill poly. Um, but this is in warped space, so this is from that bird's eye view, which we can't really overlay on that final image. It'll, it'll kind of look a little goofy. But it's pretty easy to go from that warped image to the original image if you just swap those source and destination points we talked about. So you swap those, apply that same function, that undistort function, and it'll output that nice um, overlay. If you just use this add weighted function, which adds a transparently weighted um, layer to that image. So finally, you can just throw some text on there with this put text function, and that's, um, that's how we got that nice picture. And then to run this on a series of images, um, I just used a couple, a couple tools for that, but it basically applies this same pipeline to all the images in a video and saves it at the end of the day. So that's, um, that's how I did that. But working on uh, how do we make this a little bit more robust, um, this doesn't work super well on off-highway um, driving. So when the corners are really tight, sometimes the curve fits kind of wander around, or if there's um, a car passing you, that car can throw off our, like where 
we can't see the line anymore. So um, a couple ideas for how to make it a little bit better. The image warping is assumed to be constant across all the images, all the images. so we just use those same source and destination points. But in reality, as the car moves like to the left in the lane, the start of the lines start to move. So we get a little bit of um, distortion when we go to that bird's eye view. So having a dynamic system where it picks out the start of the lines and then uses those for the um, image warping would be useful. Also, being able to dynamically control those thresholds based on how much signal is in that image. Um, so if there's something that's creating a lot of white in our binary threshold image, being able to tune those thresholds so that we scale back the content of that image. Also, the speed. Um, this obviously needs to happen in real time on a self-driving car, but it took me about three and a half minutes to process that video, which was, I don't know, maybe 20 seconds long. So um, obviously, we need to speed this one up. Um, the smoothing system I use, I just keep track of the last five previous fits and um, do an average of those fits, and that's kind of my best prediction of the, the current line. Um, but if there's sometimes in the United States, they'll divert the lanes around some construction. Um, so as those lanes shift in, um, in curvature really fast, the, the system's going to be slow to respond to that. So you know, having just a weighted average where you weight the most recent line fit, the, the highest would be useful here, um, or maybe some exponential smoothing. But other than that, um, that's the little system that I built. So are there any, are there any questions? Also, the, <laughs> the, um, that IPython notebook's available on this Git, in this GitHub repo. So if you want to play around with it yourself, um, I should probably put some install instructions because you need like OpenCV and a bunch of other tools. But um, if you go back to the warping, the first step, yeah, um, you need to find the four edge points. And I didn't quite understand how you find these four. Can you say something about that? How do I use a computer? So the question, well, I think everybody heard that. Um, image warping. Yeah, this, this one. one. So this is really just um, guess and test. Um, so I fiddled with these points until I used a straight, a straight piece of road. Um, so I knew that the final warped image was going to have straight lines. And I just fiddled with the points until I got them to be straight. And then the amount of, um, like the height of that image is based on the y value of those source points. So if you move them further out, you'll get more perspective. Like it'll look further out on the road. But um, obviously, there's a little bit less signal out there. So this is where like dynamically choosing these points would be useful because they're not always in the same position. Thanks. Yep. So you seem to rely a lot on the kind of um, empty roads that one only really sees in car commercials. And this wouldn't really be realistic for the kind of heavily trafficked roads that uh, we have in cities because cars come and obstruct your view of the lanes. I was wondering if there's any attempts to turn that noise into actual extra information. Right. Um, so yeah, this is basically a system that's only going to work in the United States on highways. Um, but it turns out that that's probably some of the most useful and easiest to solve problems in the, the self-driving car space. But yeah, I mean, just driving around Germany here, um, this system would break down really quickly. There's Sometimes there's no left lane. Um, it seems like in the United States, there's a little bit more regulation as to, you know, there's always a double yellow, which indicates I can't cross the middle, and there's always a right lane line. So um, 
you definitely need different models for different countries. And then the in-city driving would, would definitely be a challenge. I live in New York, and you know, it's just it's mayhem out there. So this would, uh, this would definitely not work in the city. But yeah, the, the techniques that they use to solve the city piece are really interesting. Um, you know, maybe next time I'll, I'll, do, I'll do one about that. <laughs> Um, did you test, uh, how did you test your algorithm? Do you have any ground truth uh, data set or how do you collect your data to test your algorithm? Or do you just look at the pictures manually and say, okay, your algorithm performs better or less good than um, your previous stage of the algorithm? Um, how do you do that? Yeah, so this is all pretty manual at the moment. Um, I should note that all this, all this data comes from um, Udacity has an open source self-driving car um, system they're trying to build. So they've got a couple hundred gigabytes of video and images that anybody can play around with. Um, but yeah, all the testing was pretty manual, you know, like manually moving those sliders around and um, looking at output images. But it, I, I was trying to think about that, how, how to like automate some of those systems. I think that'd be pretty challenging because you need you need to know what's a good lane line fit, and a computer doesn't really know that until you show it. So um, some part of the pipeline is going to have to be a little bit manual. But I think once you have this system figured out, you could train your model on you know, the output of this system and kind of create your own training data. So a quick question. Uh, you were using projections um, of your uh, environment. So my na naive idea would have been you know, to, to build a three-dimensional model uh, to do this kind of task. Is it common to use projections, or is it even possible to do a 3D modeling in real time? Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, I, I don't think they use cameras to do 3D modeling, because they have that LiDAR system. So the, the LiDAR is going to, if I shine LiDAR, like it's just a, a beam of laser light, if I shine that around this room, it's going to give me a, 3D, a set of 3D points of this room. So that's continually running on the car. So they, they overlay that with, like Google has all of their map data. And that's one way that they localize. Um, but yeah, if you have a set of, of like two cameras, you can create a, a pretty, it's a pretty rough 3D image, but that, that is possible. But with one camera, it's a little bit more challenging. As you can see, like, you lose a decent amount of image fidelity as you start like, warping around. So um, yeah, it'd be a little bit challenging, I think. But it's a neat idea. Well, I, I can formulate this in several ways, but uh, let's, put like, let's put it like this. Do you think in, in um, some future uh, TensorFlow will replace OpenCV in doing this? And uh, if, uh, if deep learning will take uh, over this field, how uh, would you see the next steps or, yeah? Yeah, I think that's... Um that kind of gets back to the previous, a previous question. Um, for sure, running a series of these images through some deep learning network um, could give you some idea of like where these edges are. It's going to start to um, develop a model that way. But I think, I think the training data is going to have to be some manual process of like picking out here is the lane, or um, or whatever. So this, you know, maybe you could use this to generate your training data. And then to run it on you know billions of images versus just a couple hundred um, by hand. So yeah, I think for sure like the future is going to be more in that direction rather than this pipeline's really slow, so it'd be hard to run in real time.
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, so the way I understood it, you're processing each image separately and then you apply the smoothing after the fact, right? But given the way the data is structured, wouldn't it be a more natural way to use the last few predictions or the last few, well, data points to uh, include them in the prediction for the next data point? So kind of you have a very strong prior of where your, um, where your lanes are from the previous image because you're taking a picture every 50 milliseconds or so, right? Right. So we, this would make it much more robust, maybe, to uh, compare to processing each image separately. Yeah. I, so I didn't really want to talk about, like, classes and annoying Python things. But yeah, so I have, like, a lane class where I keep track of the previous fits at any given point in time. Um, so I use that, and then we, um, you, so you know like kind of where the line should be, and then you just guess in that area. Uh, and then if you don't find it, that's when you fall back on kind of the, the more computationally intense process. But, but yeah, the smoothing is, is happening like in real time, like in that space or that image. Um, but yeah, for sure I should be like waiting that, for that latest fit a little bit more than the previous four or whatever. When detecting lanes in a camera image, you always have the problems with shadows and lightning conditions. Have you ever thought of fusing lane detection or using multiple sources of sensors, like you have mounted on your car, uh, for example, LIDAR sensors? Yeah, so, um, like when there's rain or snow on the camera lens, um, it's gonna be really hard to detect them. So this is just one system that these companies use to really, this is all about finding exactly where I am on the roadway. So GPS is a sensor that they use, but that's only accurate to 10 feet. Um, so you use that to kind of get you in the ballpark. You can use this to know where I am in the roadway, but also that, that LiDAR system, because Google has such good maps, they just overlay the LiDAR data with the map data and that's, that's pretty good for saying you're here plus or minus a few inches. And then there's a, there's a number of other sensors that they can use. But so this is kind of just one piece of um, the localization function as a whole of finding where you are in the world. Yeah, thanks guys.